Uh, I'm Stephen Levine, and this is Ben Hale. Uh, so we're founders of the Cloud Data Build Packs project, along with Terrence Lee and uh, Joe Kuttner at Heroku. Uh, the Cloud Native Build Packs is kind of a next-gen uh, you know, build pack API and tooling uh, for build packs for platforms to implement. Um, you know, build packs that follow the same sort of specification. Uh, it moves to moves everything to container standards like the OCI image format uh, and Docker registries. So. Uh, like I mentioned, this project is a collaboration between uh, Pivotal uh, through Cloud Foundry and Heroku, uh, and it entered the CNCF about six months ago. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is walk you through a, a case study of what it's like to patch a high CVE in OpenSSL uh, uh, in uh, sort of through the Docker file model, in the Cloud Foundry model today, and then in the Cloud Native Build Packs model. Uh, and this is a real CVE. Uh, from 2016, uh, it was, uh, I think, a malicious ciphertext uh, denial of service vulnerability. Uh, so if you have a Node.js app that's built using a Docker file, it's built using uh, a series of sort of connected images, or really using the layers from a series of connected images. So you might have an operating system packages, uh, you know, base image from an uh, operating system vendor like Canonical. Uh, that uh, someone might build a Node.js image on top of that that provides Node.js, and then somebody might install their application dependencies on top of that and creating another image. Uh, that might, that's probably gonna be the end user who's gonna launch the image in, in production. So when there's a vulnerability in OpenSSL, that's gonna be in the very sort of bottom layer of that, in the, the operating system packages layers. Uh, and so if you're a big enterprise and you have 500 Node.js apps, it's going to take a long time <laughs> to get all those patched, uh, especially if you, do not, if you don't manage your Docker files very well. So if, you, uh, if your developers all grab different base images from different places and different node versions from different places, it, when there's a CVE, it can take a really long time for them all to you know, pick up the, the things that patch those vulnerabilities from upstream sources. So who knows how long that would take for 500 apps. If you do Docker files better, uh, and you have your corporation has a trusted Node.js image, and they're all based on Ubuntu Trusty or something like that, or Bionic now, I guess, uh, then uh, you just have to wait for all your apps to rebuild on top of those images. But that can still take a really long time. And it's swapping out the same bits from underneath everything anyways. Uh, so in Cloud Foundry, we have a special model for dealing with this. We keep the application bits that are generated by a build pack separate from the operating system layer. And we use a contract called ABI compatibility, uh, which is ABI's application binary interfa interface. It means that when we look at those bottom layers and change them out, we don't, um, uh, we make sure that the packages that change are just have security patches and that they continue to be uh, dynamically linked to uh, you know, the build application and the build application doesn't have to be rebuilt. Uh, so in Cloud Foundry, our operating system package layer currently is called CF Linux FS3, and it's based off of Ubuntu Bionic. So uh, in, a, in that Node.js app, when you have that vulnerability in OpenSSL, it's that bottom layer. And so in Cloud Foundry, we have a special way of dealing with this that makes Cloud Foundry kind of unique among different platforms. So to patch those vulnerabilities, we spin up new VMs that have new uh, operating system package layers. And these are the VMs that run your applications called Diego cells. And we take the old ones down and we do this one by one until your whole platform is patched. And so this patches high CVs and open SSL sort of live in production in a few hours. Uh, a few hours on a big foundation could be much less than that on a small foundation. So for cloud native build packs, for build packs IO, we have a, we, we sort of take this Cloud Foundry model. It's also a model that's very similar to what Heroku does too. Uh, they call it a slug instead of a drop, but it's basically the same concept. <laughs> uh, we take this model and we play it, so we sort of replay it on top of a Docker registry where we uh, keep your operating system packages in one repository uh, and we keep your sort of app bits in another repository and then maybe use other repositories to store de where dependencies live to deduplicate them. And so we can upload when there's a vulnerability in those operating system packages, we can upload a new copy of them and then just update the image manifest, just a couple kilobytes per image to point at that new operating system packages layer. So it's one upload to the whole registry of the updated operating system packages. And we can just sort of flip a little bit of metadata for 500 images 
which just takes a few minutes usually for lots and lots of images, uh, to update all of your images so that they can be redeployed afterwards. This doesn't cover the, the deployment part. You still have to figure out how to orchestrate that, but it updates all of the images that quickly. And it sort of decouples patching the images from the infrastructure. So if you're on Kubernetes or whatever platform, uh, as long as you can handle deploying all those applications and re you know, redeploying them in a safe way, uh, you, you get the same benefits. So the features we use to do this, and why we haven't done this in the past on Cloud Foundry, uh, there are sort of new features in the OCI image specification, which has, unlike the original Docker image specification, uh, OCI has content addressable layers. So you can reorder the layers kind of as you want. You can sort of do rebasing without changing the IDs of each of the layers kind of arbitrarily. You can do this directly on the registry without downloading into the old layers. It's just that the Docker file model wasn't built against this idea, and so you can't sort of take advantage of it with Docker files. Uh, and uh, for there's also a feature in new Docker registries called cross repo blob mounting, where you can sort of have a one repository refer to layers in another repository without having to copy the layers between them. So now we'll talk a little bit about the new build pack API that we're providing uh, and sort of compare it to the Cloud Foundry one right now. So in Cloud Foundry, we have all these scripts. We have detect, supply, finalize, and release. In this new API, things get a little bit simpler. So we combine the supply step that supplies dependencies, the finalize step that sort of does last preparation on the app, and the release step that generates the start command into one bin build script. So things get a little simpler. Uh, but then to support really modular multi-build pack mode, where you can have lots of small build packs that are transparent working together, the detection phase across all the build packs has some metadata that gets fed into the build phase. And so if you look at the detect and build sort of scripts, we had two phases that are handled by the platform to that. Uh, so during this detection phase, an optimal group of build packs is selected. Then they all have to agree that this, is a good, this app is a good candidate for those build packs. During the analysis phase, we look at the previously generated image and pull metadata down about it. So that during the build phase, we only have to regenerate uh, layers that need to change. We actually leave layers that don't need to change on the registry. We don't build them. We don't re-upload them at all. So it's very efficient. Some, some Java build pack builds go down from 30 seconds to milliseconds because of this sort of advantage. <laughs> uh, and during the export phase, we upload the newly generated layers and then sort of reconstruct the image on the registry to point to those new layers. Uh, so I'm going to take you through what this looks like sort of step by step. Uh, and so for an application that's using, you know, in the Cloud Foundry case for Ruby, we'd probably have three build packs, and Node, we'd probably have four build packs, but in the simple example, I'm gonna say this is one application that has Ruby and Node dependencies, and pretend that we just have one monolithic Ruby build pack and one monolithic Node build pack, just to kind of make it easier to understand. So uh, during the uh, detection phase, the first the Ruby build pack runs, and this can actually happen in parallel to some extent, but I'm not gonna go into that exactly. Uh, when the Ruby build pack runs, it looks at the app and says, yes, uh, I'm a good candidate for this, and it moves on to the Node.js build, or sorry, it generates some metadata about what it saw in the application. Then the Node.js build pack runs, looks at the app, and says, yep, this is a good Node app. Also generates some metadata about the Node.js version, for instance. Uh, this metadata is fed into the build phase, so that when the Ruby build pack does the build phase, it generates some new layers, the Ruby layer and the gems layer. It might also modify the app directory here, too. Uh, then the Node.js build pack runs, and this happens always happens serially. Uh, it gets metadata that uh, it gets that planned metadata, but without the information that the Ruby build pack used. Uh, and then it gets to write new layers. Uh, so to kind of take you through this, uh, going through one build and then a build afterwards to sort of better demonstrate the efficiency. If you have that Ruby node, node app, analysis runs and doesn't do anything because it's the first build. Build runs, installs Ruby, does bundle install, installs Node, does npm install. The new layers are exported to the image. And then in the second build, when the app's changed, and maybe in this case, uh, just the Node and Node modules and gems changed, but the rest didn't, then we read metadata about those layers. We uh, build just the layers that need to change, so npm install and bundle install, but no you know, recopying of Ruby or Node. And then we export just those changed layers back up to the registry with the different app layers, too. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ben for a demo. OK. Um, before we head into the demos, does anybody have any questions about what we just saw there? No? OK. So um, 
I'm going to do uh, demos of three new things that you can do with cloud native build packs that you weren't previously able to do or were not able to do um, particularly easily. Uh, and um, all of these are going to be centered around that pack CLI that I did in the demo yesterday. And since I have a bit more time today, I can explain to you a little bit more about what exactly is going on. So the, the cloud native build pack specification um, differs significantly from the previous build pack spec because in addition to defining sort of what a build pack expects to be called, right? So like whether you're going to call bin uh, detect, bin build, things like that, and what your obligations are as a build pack implementer, it also defines the other side of that interaction as well in a way that we never did before. It defines how the platform interacts with build packs themselves and sort of the, the implementation of that, that specification, right? Of the two sides coming together is something that we call the life cycle. And the life cycle is really interesting. We have a reference implementation that we know is going to be used inside of you know, Cloud Foundry and Pivotal products, but we expect it to also be used inside of Heroku as well. So since we have this thing, this life cycle thing, it turns out it's just a Go binary, um, we can wrap that on a bunch of different platforms. We can wrap it for Cloud Foundry, we can wrap it for Heroku, and we can wrap it in this PAC CLI that I, I'm going to use today. So that PAC CLI then is just a very thin wrapper that exercises exactly the same code we'd expect to everywhere else. So the first demo that we're going to um, we're going to jump off with is basically an extension, a demonstration of what we just saw um, uh, Stephen talk about. So we're going to do a PAC build here. Pack build. Make sure I build the correct one. Okay. And so we're just going to build the same thing we did yesterday in the demo. We're going to build a pre-compiled Java application. I really wanted to come in here and show you all that for the first time on the Java build pack side, you can actually build from source now. But the conference internet is slow enough that that's just not going to happen. <laughs> it begins with downloading all of Maven. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure you all wanted to get out of here before that was done. So we see, um, as we saw yesterday, um, there's a, a build pack group up here that we're going to skip because it happens to be the one that has RIF, our um, uh, function as a service in it. But in this particular case, we hit our second one that has an open JDK build pack and the JVM application build pack in here. And so um, we see that we get this contribution of open JDK 1102 to a launch layer. Basically, we have the, um, it says it's reusing the cache download. So offline build pack style, we have the, the tar, tar file there, and we have to untar it onto the file system, and then we have to upload that data to a registry somewhere. And so you sort of think to yourself, well, that can't possibly take that long. In reality, it's about a second and a half, two seconds to do something like that. But we're working on eking out every single second in our build packs, right? We want to make sure that you can get into running situations as quickly as possible. And this is really, really critical in something like a function as a service kind of environment. And as I said, Project Riff earlier on, right? We are actually already have a customer for these build packs. If you have ever used anything from Project Riff or if you've used um, the PAS, or sorry, PFS um, beta product and things like that, they already use cloud native build packs for this. Just another place that we've, um, another platform that has uh, opted to use that lifecycle reference implementation. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to run this and I'm not gonna hold it because I want you to see again as we go through the, the, the build pack, the build bit of it, see how quickly it can actually cycle through and it's done, right? Because this time we reuse that cache layer. The spec gives you a way to, without actually downloading the layer back to you, whoever you are, in this case the pack CLI, to take a look at some metadata that's, that's attached to the image but not the data attached to the image, and do a comparison. And if you are satisfied that what that layer was created from or that, that metadata matches what you think it is previously, then you can just go ahead and say, oh, I'm going to reuse this layer. I don't need it, and I don't need to rebuild it. I don't need to spend that second to two seconds building it and another bit of time uploading it. Question over there. Right, so the question is, what exactly is the contract of the metadata that you put, you attach to each layer? The contract is actually only between you and yourself in the future, right? So the question of whether or not I am going to rebuild this JRE is only for me to look at a piece of what everybody else should consider to be completely opaque metadata. So you could imagine, for example, um, 
version 11.0.3 of the JDK comes out. I'm going to compare that and say, hey, I was at 11.02 previously. This time I'm going to do 11.03 instead. So it only matters to me. Nobody else gets to view that particular metadata. It, can it break your downstream layers? Sure. I mean, if I put something that wasn't the JRE back in a layer called the JRE, yeah, absolutely that can. And so you're, we generally only use layers and update layers that are equivalent things, right? No matter what, only a JRE is going to go here and only a particular version of a JRE is going to go here. And if you ask for a different one, um, say you ask to go back to Java 8, but your application code is in is compiled for Java 11 or something like that, sure, you can absolutely cause problems that way. But it's sort of a loose coupling and you have to kind of keep your eye out. If you know your source code or your compiled code is Java 8, then you need to make sure that you request a Java 8 JVM and you expect that the OpenJDK build pack will provide that for you. Maybe, you know, 8.101 and then 8.202 and then 8.303, but you've asked for Java 8 and you're gonna get Java 8. So just to give you a, a comparison of what this looks like, um, when you run it with Pack or you run it in the life cycle, um, we only download the metadata about the image and not actually the image. I can't reproduce that particularly easily. I mean, I can type about 11 different commands and get that, but we're gonna, I'm just gonna pull the whole thing so you can um, see what it looks like. So on that image, there's some metadata that looks like this. Um, for each individual layer, and so these are layer names right here, tells you sort of what the SHA is, and the data that we've opted to put into it. And so this bit here is opaque, but what we've chosen to do is we represent um, build pack dependencies. Uh, I think I can do a cat build packs, open JDK build pack, build pack.toml, like this. Um, we represent a dependency sort of like this inside of a TOML representation. And we use this to say, if any of this has changed, I want to rebuild a layer. If this hasn't changed, then I just want to use it as is. The key thing, obviously, is this SHA right here. As long as I planned on untarring the exact same binary I had before, I don't need to do it again. So yeah, let's go back here. Again, represent it all in here. But it doesn't have to be this dependency. You could write any, any sort of data that you wanted here to help you compare earlier, uh, later on when you take a look at it. So you could imagine um, like the NPM lock file or something like that might be a good candidate. If there's any change, I want to regenerate um, all of my modules. Uh, okay. So that's um, avoidance of layer creation. The next thing we're gonna talk about is um, the way we get to use multi-build pack and that modularity that I showed off yesterday to say, okay, I want to do some sort of replacement, some sort of modification, but I wanna do it without forking my entire uh, build pack. So a really common thing inside of the Java build pack was I don't want to use OpenJDK. I have Oracle, or I run on top of AWS, or I run on top of Azure, or I'm an SAP customer and I wanna use SAP machine again instead. So I'm gonna show you um, what we call a builder.toml file. The plan is, Unless you, plan, unless you go out and use pack .cli, or the pack CLI today, you shouldn't really ever have to see this. We expect this to be sort of managed by the platforms, but it does give you sort of a really low level view of us acting as a platform, what exactly we're doing. So the first thing is there's a definition of all of the build packs, basically just a bag of all of the build packs that you might have access to. And so we have things like SAP machine, we have all the stuff for Project Riff, a bunch of stuff around Node.js and NPM, and of course all of the um, Java build packs as well. Then once you have those, you organize them into groups and groups are both ordered and describe optionality. And so right now, the second group, the one that detected uh, that we saw before, is one that starts with OpenJDK, then contributes a build system optionally, JVM application is required, then New Relic and then so on and so on from there. So what we want to do though is, as I said before, we don't want to use uh, the Cloud Foundry OpenJDK. We want to use SAP Machine instead, which is an OpenJDK compatible um, variant uh, available from SAP, as you might expect. So I'm going to go back. I need to do a create builder. Open source is going to take a second to actually do. I probably should have kicked that off. Um, what we're doing is we're creating a builder image in order to guarantee that there is sort of a controlled environment where your application is built the same way every single time. We actually create an image with all of the build packs and all this metadata inside of it. And when your application is handed to us, we start that up inside of a container. 
and then we actually build your application in that controlled environment. That's the way you can guarantee you get reproducible builds, not just on a given platform. You, we're not saying that the environment is consistent between um, Cloud Foundry and another bit of Cloud Foundry. We're actually saying it's consistent potentially across all of these different platforms, the same on PAX CLI as it is on Cloud Foundry, as it is on Heroku. So this time, if I go ahead and do that same pack build command that I did before, same command we did before, without having modified any of the existing build packs, the JVM application build pack, but it would have worked for any of the rest of these as well, things like the Azure Application Insights build pack or the Google Stack Driver one. Now all of a sudden the SAP machine one starts kicking in, contributing the SAP machine, doing some configuration of it around Bosch DNS and a bunch of other tools that go along with that. And again, we haven't actually forked a build pack. There's sort of a conceptual idea that an operator somewhere has made some modification, but not to a build pack in the way that you've had to before, where you have to constantly keep up with version updates and things like that, right? Every time I make a commit to the Java build pack, if you have a fork, you need to make sure that you consume that and get all of the security fixes and improvements and things like that. This takes that out of your hand. As long as you're um, always staying up to date with SAP machine, the fact that you've swapped it out instead of using the OpenJDK means you're going to stay up to date without a huge amount of effort. Okay, and then the final thing that we're going to demonstrate here is um, what I call a cross-cutting build pack. Uh, one of the um, things especially APM vendors really like about this new thing is previously, if you wanted to integrate, say your new Relic, and you wanted to integrate into the build packs, um, you'd run into situations where, um, uh, sorry, Totally lost my train of thought here. Um, you'd run into situations where integrating into the Java build pack happened one way. Integrating into the Node build pack happened another way. And there's very good reasons we'd want um, that integration into the Java build pack to be consistent with all of the other integrations into the Java build pack. If you're a Java developer, you should expect to configure these integrations in the same way to find which versions of a dependency you're supposed to use in a, in a good way. And the same thing true on the Node side. You expect all the integrations into Node to look very similar to one another. But now if we've got this modularity, we have this possibility, instead of being consistent with each language, that we can have a vertical slice effectively. We can say New Relic needs to be sort of consistent with itself across multiple languages. So we'll go ahead and do a, let's see, pack build. We'll do the Java one and I'll add some new relic configuration. So effectively, while this kicks off, um, adding in that end file at the end, effectively what this does is that end file exposes what you guys think of as VCAP services, as a service payload for actually binding to new relic. Um, it's uh, likely gonna change name to CNB services, to be cloud native build pack and portable across multiple platforms again, because one of the key things is we want this image to be, go, be able to go to a bunch of different places, but fundamentally the payload is exactly the same. So again, we see some very nice um, avoidance here, and this time New Relic fired off and contributed the um, version 4.11 of its agent and configured some uh, properties that are going to run. So now, if I pull that same thing, Uh, yeah, that's the one I want. Uh, and I'm um, nope, not gonna run a different one. That one here. If we go ahead and run that same thing, but again, putting the end file with the new relic um, configuration in it, we go ahead and fire that thing off. Uh, we'll see that it starts connecting to New Relic. I'll let it go the whole way out and demonstrate that it is actually um, has made a connection. But one of the key things you'll uh, you'll see in these new um, build packs, we've taken the opportunity. This isn't something you technically couldn't do, but it was something we didn't do very often. We actually now only resolve service credentials at runtime. They never get baked into the image. And in, in the old days, um, there were many places all over the Java build pack. I know, you know, very uh, very explicitly where we baked in service credentials into the droplet itself. The service was bound during staging time, which is still a requirement, but then we would like read the license key, right? And write it onto the file system in the configuration file for New Relic. Now we've been really, really explicit because we want this portability between all these different platforms and all these different environments. 
even though it is much harder to do, we will only resolve those things at runtime. So when I say much harder to do, literally every single integration we're doing at this point has some little helper application, yet another Go application that has to be contributed. So I've got Go apps and Go apps and Go apps at this point um, that knows how to read the, the JSON payload out of an environment variable, write whatever needs to be done for New Relic or App Dynamics or um, Elastic APM or something like that into the environment only at runtime and off it goes. So we've got a Java application and somewhere in here it says it's reporting to New Relic right here. But without making any changes, I'm telling you that they, we are using the exact same um, New Relic build pack we did before. I want to do a pack build again, but this time we're going to build a Node NPM application. This application is basically hello world as I remember it. We're making sure that env New Relic is on the uh, environment again, because we still need a signal, right? We still need to know that it is appropriate for me to add the Node.js agent. Even though we're not going to look at the values in it, we do need to know that the service is there to make sure that all the binaries that are necessary are available. The alternative is for me to pack in all of the 40 integrations into every single one of your applications, and trust me, you really don't want me to do that. <laughs> So uh, off we go, we'll go ahead and do um, another Docker pull of this particular application. Snowed application. And not the Java one, the Node one. This time around, uh, it is somewhere in here starting new relic for Node.js um, and tells us that this is where we are streaming all of our data to. And so one of the last things I want to do here in our last couple of minutes is I do want to show you what sort of a modern um, build pack actually looks like. I'm gonna use this new relic build pack as an example of it. So what you're going to find out, if you are familiar with the build packs as they exist today, specifically the Java build pack, we are switching over to Go from, um, from Ruby as it was before. Uh, there are reasons, historical reasons why it was Ruby originally, mostly because it sort of predates the existence of Go. Um, and then so many people had forked it that migrating was going to be kind of a problem and be horribly breaking. But to be sort of good citizens inside the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, Go is a good choice. We're gonna do it. You're not required to as part of the spec. The spec basically says that there must be a slash bin build and a slash bin detect, right? Whatever language those executables are in doesn't matter, you could write it in bash as some of our samples are, right? But in our particular case, we've chosen Go, and I wanted to sort of show you the kind of things that we're doing to get this cross-platform behavior. So we have um, sort of a language binding um, that we call lib build pack that sits on top of the specification. If you're a Go developer, I expect there to be more lib build pack equivalents for other programming languages. People can write um, build packs in anything that they really choose to. But what we're doing effectively here is say, hey, is there a new relic service? If there is a new relic service and it has a license key credential, I, I might be able to participate. And if that's the case, someone else has told me that this is a JVM application, right? This is one of those other key things about the modularity is we saw a lot of people when they were in situations where they were trying to do a multi-build pack kind of uh, deployment that they were having to detect on, in multiple places whether or not is this a Java application, is this a Node application, is this a Ruby application, and all of them use different sort of heuristics to determine whether or not those things were true. Now what we want to do is there is some authority the JVM application build pack in this case, that defines this is what it means to be a JVM application. It knows about uh, Java, it knows about Kotlin, it knows about Scala, it knows about all of these different languages that make up the JVM uh, ecosystem. So now the, no, the, sorry, the new Relic build pack never needs to detect it, it just needs to say, hey, am I a JVM application? If I am, I want you to participate, basically contribute the Java agent dependency in the future. On the Node side, if this is a Node application, Right, if, if someone else has detected this for me, then I want to participate in it by adding that um, agent dependency there. We also sort of blindly ask for Python, if Python is available since one of the, um, the and New Relic agent uh, dependencies can be natively compiled if Python's around and falls back if it's not. So we sort of make a, a shot in the dark and say, hey, if there's Python about, if I could have Python, please give me some Python so that I can build this thing. Okay, so.
So end of the demo. Um, as we announced yesterday, uh, our first public beta came out earlier this week. Um, the PAX CLI that you saw me playing around with, I highly encourage you to use it. Um, all the build packs that you saw me demoing here are available inside of that, and they're all based on your favorite Ubuntu-based operating system uh, image. Finally, um, feel free to join us on our Slack to discuss this. It's pretty vibrant, um, judging by the number of, you know, sort of um, notifications I've gotten in my pocket while I've been standing up here. It seems to be going quite nicely. And uh, thank you. And any questions? In fact, it's so the question is um, previously we had very little bit little visibility about what was contributed into a build pack or into an application when a build pack was used. Uh, it seems like there's going to be less. The answer is actually there's going to be significantly more. <laughs> One of the contracts is that um, we build a bill of materials. Every time a build pack um, contributes something to a layer, it has the opportunity, and certainly we take it very heavily, to describe exactly what was put onto that particular layer. So that whole dependency thing where it said it's OpenJDK 11 version, blah, 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 it has this shot, and in more, most importantly to a lot of people, it has this license attached to it, that will all be in uh, metadata attached to the image itself, so you can literally query against a registry and find out exactly what was put in there. Um, our build packs will also go through, um, on the Java side, something that people have really, really wanted for a long time. We will enumerate like all the jar file dependencies in your Spring Boot application or your web application and do a best effort. Like We're not going to resolve them back to names, but we'll say it's you know Spring-Core version 5.2.1 release, and those will be exposed through the same bill of materials as well. So I think that's probably yeah. way more than you were expecting. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, it was one of those things like we knew that this was an issue, but every other time we tried to solve this problem, we tried to solve it by kicking data back to the cloud controller. And we basically said, uh, we're not going to wait for the cloud controller to sort of deem this to be a priority. It will be part of the specification because it's that important. It will attach to each individual image. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> So we haven't uh, like fleshed out the integration with Cloud Controller yet, but we're, we're sorry. Oh uh, yeah, the, repeat the question. Sorry. Uh, what will this integration look like with Cloud Controller? Uh, in how will Cloud Controller expose you know what's in these images and what build packs they're built with and and all those things? Um, so we haven't figured out the integration with Cloud Controller yet, uh, but um, because we're exposing all this metadata on the images, we can we can expose it through Cloud Controller. And I think when we're looking at this, we're looking at it like can we have a more declarative model for images where you're saying, uh, this is what I want in my image, and you're having the platform continue to build images to meet that instead of having developers go, I want to restage this now because I think there may be CVEs in it, right? Yeah. We want to move to things automatically get rebuilt, and then your pipelines can pick up on them automatically and get promoted through environments and kind of... Yeah, kind yeah. of be more proactive about that as a platform. Because yeah. one of the sort of insidious bugs that people don't realize is it's one thing for the um, 
for operators to make sure build packs are staying up to date so that every newly staged application is up to date, but then you also have to keep track of all of the applications that aren't regularly restaged, right? And I know a lot of you know um, companies that do the former and haven't even thought that the second one is a, is a vector for vulnerability. Yeah. So we want, that's why the, the declarative model of basically taking it out of your hands and you don't actually ever cause a build. You say, I want an image to look like this and builds may happen to get you there. Think Bosch-like or something like that. Uh, you can do that right now. So we, the, the PAC CLI that Ben just showed you, it, uh, it works on a local workstation. You can build your images. They build the exact same way they would in a platform. We actually did the local integration <laughs> before the platform integration this time. So you can, yeah, it all, all works. It's, it was one of the key requirements that allowed, or that, that sort of caused us to build this generic life cycle that everybody uses, whether it's us, Heroku, your laptop, where, what have you, to make sure we could get consistent stuff out of it. In the back. when the relayering as in the rebase, right? So um, the only thing that we are committed to rebasing at this time is the operating system. The operating system has a, um, uh, a guaranteed ABI compatibility. And while I'm not saying Canonical has never broken ABI compatibility, um, we sort of depend on it for you know tens, hundreds of millions of rebases across Cloud Foundry over the last five years. I don't think I mean I, I I don't think so um, I don't think we're going to add any flags in there simply because it goes uh, it's almost impossible for us to tell after the fact or sorry before an application starts that it might break um, so then you basically have the health checks as applications are started up right I think there, there are sort of two levels to this, right? There's the talking about the operating system package level and the application layers and being able to rebase that out from under the application layers, right? And that, that contract is very tight. We do this on Cloud Foundry already in production for lots and lots of apps. It's never broken. We've never had a report of it being broken. So we're not very worried about that because it's just security patches from operating system vendors that do lots of testing, right? But then at the application level, the contract between those layers is, is very strict in a different way. It's sort of enforced to be everything's installed in these different directories and there's a you know, very particular contract between there so that there isn't a possibility of layers, the order of layers mattering there or anything like that. So we, we think the whole thing is very safe in the way we've implemented it. Even, even though Docker files might not let you do that usually. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's call it. Uh, thank you all for coming here. We'll answer any questions down on the floor if you need us.